Hi everyone in North America, Europe, Romania, and anywhere in the world. Today's uh, topic is race and racism. And we have the perfect interlocutor to have this difficult but timely conversation. And that is Professor Marius Turda, Romanian, British uh, historian and uh, academic. A, um, a, true, uh, a true expert. Here are some of the titles. Um, Modernism and uh, Eugenics, uh, Crafty Humans from Genesis, uh, from Genesis to Eugenics and Beyond, uh, The Idea of National Superiority in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, Religion, Evolution and Heredity, uh, science and uh, ethnicity, the anthropological research in Romania in the 1930s. Uh, Professor Turda, Turda, welcome to the program. Thank you for having accepted our invitation. Thank you very much indeed. I do appreciate it. It's a real pleasure and uh, I do look forward to our conversation. Uh, Professor, I'd like to start by asking you whether you think uh, we live in racist times, or do you think this is all in the past? Regrettably, we always lived in racist times, uh, since probably the 18th century onwards. Uh, now, of course, racism reaches a certain intensity across time and across space. So you may not feel it in certain parts of the world, or you may not feel it as much in your society. But regrettably, racism is a very subterraneous creature. It always lives underneath the surface and then always it appears. There. Regrettably, it is always there. We haven't managed quite successfully to extirpate, to excise this um, cangrene on our mental um, consciousness, if you want, or our social behavior, or our political activity, and so on and so forth. And I suppose nowadays it's even more pronounced. It's even more visible, I suppose, um, than it's been, say, 10 years ago, particularly in, across the Atlantic, particularly in the US, uh, in Britain and across Europe. So you see the revival of various forms of racism nowadays. We'll, let's talk about um, a bit um, of the, the, the history of um, racism. Uh, of uh, the discovery of race. Um, why, why do you think it was um, discovered in the modern times? Um, weren't people always aware that they, uh, of the racial differences or even racial hierarchies? Uh, people were always aware of certain differences, be they cultural, linguistic or religious. So, of course, the ancient Greeks knew how to differentiate between the Greeks and the barbarians. The oh. ancient Egyptians knew, of course, how to differentiate between their own people, their own empire and other African empires, uh, you know, southern uh, or more deeper into the heart of Africa and so on and so forth. And of course, in medieval times, you have a very clear understanding of differences uh, based on what we may call today uh, racial characteristics, in other words, physical characteristics. And of course, with that also came a certain hierarchical arrangement of the world. The Greeks believe they're of course superior people as much as the ancient Egyptians believe they are superior people or ancient Sumerians or indeed ancient Indians or ancient uh, Chinese. Those who created the greatest civilizations of the ancient times. So of course they did believe they have something that allows them to be on a different level of uh, civilization or culture than other peoples who do not possess that. So you always have that, I suppose. The interesting thing that happened uh, in modern times is that that category of race, that category of difference or racial difference was never instrumentalized, used uh, extensively to explain human differences. Um, it, 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 it's always, always a, a problem where you could date the emergence of race and historians are debating quite heavily about whether we could place it in medieval times with the Crusades uh, or after the Crusades. So in other words, the first major antagonism between the Christians 
and the Muslims, or whether we could actually place it uh, more recently with the Enlightenment, and we have the German philosophers and Scottish and uh, British uh, and American philosophers uh, then, uh, who actually, during the 18th and 19th century, proposed, uh, with the help of science, particularly the, uh, the, the discovery or the development of evolutionism, Darwinism, positivism, sociology, and so on and so forth. So then you have a more modern understanding of race. So this is a, a, a continuum or continuous debate, if you wish, between scientists, historians, and uh, the general public. Uh, but I suppose uh, the very simple question, uh, answer to the question would be like, uh, it's always existed. The question becomes problematic, or indeed an issue for us humans, is when we use it to exploit, oppress, govern, control people. In other words, it becomes an instrument of power uh, over other people. So um, we have very rare incidents, although they do exist in medieval times or in, in ancient times. Um, and now it's a big debate in... Yes, there is a big debate in medieval studies now about race in medieval times. Mm -hmm. However, very rarely we can identify race as a tool of oppression uh, in medieval times. I mean, we look at a city like London, for example. Now we know that after the big plague, there were many people, now we've seen, in a way, excavations of, of signs that can be traced back to the back plate, I should say. Uh, and we can actually document now, with the help of science, the ethnic origin of those people. And actually, we have a high number of people who are not white. There were many black people living already at the time in the British Isles, uh, what will later become, um, of course, Britain. Uh, so that's very early on. Uh, it's, a, it's not a monochromatic society, um, and we have similar examples across Europe. So we have this image, of course, we project it backwards, that Europe in particular can be defined as a white continent, but actually this is quite inaccurate, not to say offensive to other people who actually have lived here for centuries. Uh, so it is not easy to place it, but I suppose with mo modern times or modernity, as you rightly pointed out in your question, we have a different way of instrumentalizing race and racism that actually tends to go towards oppression, colonialism, mm -hmm. imperialism, uh, so the modern system of um, oppression, which you are now familiar with. Because something, uh, something important um, and, uh, and dark even happens in the 18th century and 19th century with the advent of science and all these differences become uh, that or scientists start to describe these people in very scientific terms just for comparison but very soon uh, hierarchies appear and the idea of uh, race superiority uh, is uh, is there, and as you as you rightly say, uh, the uh, the political doctrine or the ideology of racism uh, is born. Take us a little bit on this path of transformation from from an object of science to uh, a political object, to a political doctrine, to an ideology that is. Um, uh, is used for domination and imperialism. Uh, yes, you could see these two directions emerging clearly with the 17th century. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, of course, you have the expansion of European empires across the world. So you have the need in a way to justify certain cultural behavior patterns that Europeans encountered in the new territories or the territories they, they, they pretended they discovered and then later colonized. So we see this in the new world that happened, uh, what later would become United States of America. We see that in the 16th century with the Native Americans there. We see this, of course, across Africa. Uh, and of course, we even see it in, in India to some extent. So you have that kind of need for the European countries uh, particularly the European powers who developed colonial empires to justify somehow culturally and in, in civilizational terms, the right to conquer and the right 
to govern others. And they used race in this context, uh, sometimes explicitly, we are the superior people, we deserve, you are our slaves, you deserve to be in that submission or that submissive position. Uh, otherwise, implicitly, in a very subtle way of redirecting the entire energy, cultural uh, and otherwise of that particular conquered country towards the metropolis in the way that became very successful, for example, in the French context, the whole idea of the, the uh, civilize, civilizing mission of the French culture and language in the way that the British did it in a way, um, uh, to some extent in the same way. So you have these ideologies already early on uh, working hard to harness, to attract the potential uh, provided, the potential for domination provided by, by race and racism. Um, with the 19th century, of course, then nationalism kicks in quite forcefully. And then on the, un on the other hand, you have imperialism, but uh, at the same time, you have the development of nationalism in Europe and a lot of the nationalist um, authors and nationalist ideologies would often use race to discuss issues such as historical continuity, the right of a particular territory. We're talking about a continent over which people have, you know, had fought for millennia. So to which country or group of people this land should belong uh, was a very hot uh, debate amongst nationalists in the 19th century. And we know this in the case of Romania or in the case of uh, uh, Greece or in the case of Hungary or in the case of Germany, Italy. So you have it throughout. Now, so this is one very important erection or tradition within which race flourishes, develops, intersects ideology, intersects idioms of power, intersects the, the state, um, and then the national state as it emerges. The intersection of uh, nationalism and, uh, and racism, or the idea of, yes. the of race. Exactly. And here, of course, you have the epitome of that, I suppose, is what happens in the 20th century in the extreme case of Nazism of course. Uh, in Europe, or of course, in the case of South Africa, in the, the, the racial regime, uh, regime there. Uh, but of course, in other forms, even in a country which allegedly is not nationalistic, such as the US, uh, of a, even there, you have forms of American nationalism intersecting quite seriously with race and racism early on. So we're talking about since the moments of the founding fathers when they developed the entire messianic understanding of America's destiny in the world and its mission to the whole, you know, the frontier and, the, it's, and so on and so forth. So that's one a very important direction. But you have it, and I want to finish that so I don't concentrate solely on, on the yeah, US. Because I have a couple of uh, questions, you know, on the pipeline. I just wanted to mention, uh, I, I mean, wanted to, to mention, uh, of course, uh, that, that is something that developed in, in Japan as well, so uh, in China. So. Uh, we have this idea that actually the West is, and probably the West is indeed uh, overtly racist, but you have forms of racism developing in other countries, which is outside in a way what we normally call the West and Japan, I suppose, particularly in the 20th century, developed quite aggressive forms of racism towards its neighbors. Okay, so that's one tradition. The other one is the one provided by science, as you, as you noted, and that's a very problematic one and um, extremely uh, complicated in many ways because it's not just the contribution of one science or one discipline. So you have anthropology com contributing extensively to this since this uh, 18th century uh, onwards that all discussion about human differences, measurements from the measurement of skulls, the measurement of bodies, hair, just how big is the head, what the form, what the, what form does the, the head has. Exactly. Form. Then uh, ethnography, comparative linguistics, philosophy, uh, and then sociology and so on and so forth. So, and then of course, with the development of, and medicine, uh, I shouldn't forget, and with the development of um, modern biology and genetics, of course, the development of eugenics. Eugenics contributes initially and then genetics, the whole discussion about scientific ways, allegedly called, uh, so, or pseudoscientific, rather, of essentializing, ins inscribing in stone and making them look as, as if they are permanent differences between human beings. So what previously was understood culturally was whereas a matter of environment, uh, 
now becomes more hardened by a scientific approach to human difference that actually says very simply, you cannot transpass your biology, the color of your skin. You cannot become white. You cannot become European. You cannot become Western, no matter how much you imitate, how much us, how much you speak our language, how much, because your natural state, be that white or black or whatever, uh, or be that tall or short or be that straight, uh, or, or and so on and so forth, Christian or Catholic. It's, you could add any adjective you want to this list. Um, it's set in stone, it's dictated by the forces of nature. It is a thing uh, permanent that in many ways, those who believe in the biblical way of putting that racism would have argued that this is what God had wanted, this is what had God created. Of course, we hear this very much across America, in particular, you have a form of American fundamentalism, which is Christian, which believes that, of course, the whites are destined uh, by divine intervention or entrusted by God to actually govern and rule America. So you have that extreme, and you have white supremacists in New Zealand or in Europe who believed the same that actually so they, they do add certain religious globally elements. spread these attitudes are globally spread right? indeed so you have this very interesting fusion which would require a, a detailed conversation maybe another time about how much science and in which period science contributed more <clears throat> excuse me more or less to yeah. reifying race to making it look real to making it look objective uh, objective in, in or to make it look uh, attractive to a wide range of people, not just uh, educated elites, but across the, the generational divide and indeed across the generational divide. So you have young people believing in it as much as old people, educated and less educated people. Um, and uh, it is a constant struggle to uh, argue against the scientific use of various uh, forms of explaining human difference, which are very easily tainted by, by its appropriation. Um, and, and racist and people who believe in race use it very, uh, very easily. I, I'd like to go back um, to a, um, an earlier point about uh, racial uh, superiority. So uh, um, what, what was, um, where was it, uh, or in what was it grounded in the, uh, when, when it, uh, you know, when, when this idea um, started to, uh, to find its way uh, in, I don't know, material superiority in, uh, I mean, somebody saw that, you know, maybe, you know, we are, um, healthier, uh, uh, wealthier, and, uh, and I don't know, a taller, and that's, uh, that gives us the impression that, you know, we're somehow superior. How this idea, how this idea of superiority developed? Uh, and what was, uh, what was the, the main ingredient in, uh, in it? It is only with the, 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 the feeling and the attitude uh, and the conception and the mental capacity to portray someone as superior and others as inferior, that racism is at play. Uh, so you might have ideas of race circulating around navigating, navigating the globe, but it is only the moment really when people start to, to describe themselves as superior and others as inferior, that this form of racism becomes um, very clear. And what we know from history is that it started early, early on um, one of very important British um, um, sociologists and uh, uh, scholar of race, uh, Stuart Hall, um, has this example he shared uh, often. He said, uh, the moment the Europeans arrived in the New World and they met the Native Americans. So um, early on, um, the first question they asked themselves was not whether these are, is this my brother? Is this my sister? Is this my father? They, they ask themselves, are these different humans? Are these different creatures? Are they created differently? They believe themselves, the Spanish and the Portuguese, to be superior to the native population they encountered. So then you have already the moment with the colonial expansion of Europe, you have 
this formulation of superiority of the white people, the superiority of the European culture being gradually formed and then emerging quite forcefully by, by the 18th century with the Enlightenment, which contrary to its, or notwithstanding its achievements, it also demonstrated and tried to explain very clearly that the European and the Western European mind is the most superior form, whether in classical music or philosophy or in arts, Europe has produced the finest examples of the human mind. It's the most superior form of human achievement. Uh, so you have that working hard already across um, uh, Europe and the world uh, since early on. Um, and then you have this translated into racial typologies where certain races are superior. So of course you have the whole discussion about the Aryan races, and then in the 19th century, the Nordic races, and of course the Anglo-Saxons and so on and so forth. And then within that, within Europe, as much as this would be then translated into the American context, you have a, a hierarchy of races and nations. So you have the English and the Germans and the Scandinavians were using a great deal of the whole idea of the Nordic race to describe the Mediterranean people the Italians or the, the Spanish or the Greeks uh, as inferior as much as they would describe uh, the East Europeans uh, the people from the Balkans as inferior uh, because of their tainted racial characteristics, their racial mixing. So the purer they could stay, the more superior they were. So they would have, they would, they would have argued. So in the Scandinavian countries, we have still some of the finest specimen of the white race you know, tall and blonde, blue eyes, uh, completely fabricated metaphors, of course, of national, uh, well, ethnic or racial belonging. But- um, Apparently we are not in that group. <laughs> but other people who are, you know, exactly, since people like you and I who are more dark, <laughs> and, particularly me, and now I'm very, very, very uh, we, 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 never, we never fared very well on this scale. So by the 20th century, of course, you have, full-blown uh, racial typologies. Uh, the Jews are inferior, the Roma are inferior, um, and that is translates uh, in many contexts. So um, it is in a way a, a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. uh, certain countries, particularly in the southern part of Europe or eastern part of Europe, uh, in Eastern Europe, adopted this kind of rhetoric to describe their own populations within a certain system of uh, arrangement that put the majority in positions of power. There were the superior people and put others, particularly ethnic minorities, in a position of, of, of submission um, as it happened with the Roma across Eastern Europe, uh, of course, and as it happened in Romania. But um, you can't really depoliticize this conversation. So there is no value, there's no, of course, we try very hard to understand this in a very objective and neutral way. But ultimately, whether you're a sociologist or a political scientist or a historian, you do come with, 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 with quite your own biases um, that are, not, are given also from the way you were you brought up or your family origins or uh, the society you live in, but also from the, your profession. So I do recognize that myself, obviously, no, hard, no matter how hard you and I or uh, we try very hard, of course, to stay neutral and try to explain things, but ultimately we have to be aware of our own biases. So, so do you say that in, you know, even in liberal minds or people who are very uh, liberal and of course profess anti-racism, um, uh, racism credos uh, as I think they ought, uh, they may be still racist and sometimes I think we, we can find ourselves in, in this position. Is, is that what you're saying? To some extent, yes. Uh, it is it's, it's very difficult and, uh, to actually live out any, um, any bias whatsoever. Uh, so, and this is the conversation to be had, I suppose, particularly nowadays. Uh, how well, much- it, well, That's why this conversation is so important and we very much wanted to have it. Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, it, it's really, really hard. How can you, uh, and you know, you could see this if we look at the two countries we chose for our comparison, if we look at America and we look at Romania, 
we do have very well intended people in both countries, uh, you know, um, Romanians or Americans, white Americans in America, let's be more specific, and Romanians uh, in Romania, who are actually extremely willing to not see race, to not be racist, and they genuinely believe they are not racist at all. However, it's, it's extremely difficult to de to, to decontextualize them so much as to actually uh, convincingly uh, believe them, because even if they are, and I completely believe them, they are genuine and they're very well meant and uh, well intended, they do come and they do, they do exist in a society that actually follows different rules and principles. And that society, particularly in America, is racist. And certain instances in Romania uh, more recently are clearly racist, say against the Roma. Uh, so is there, a, is there a way, an efficient way to practically efface or eradicate or eliminate racism? That's, that's a very important question I and one we're, we're struggling yeah. with yeah. since uh, the 1940s, 50s onwards. And you have absolutely, uh, we have amazing models to follow, you know, from Martin Luther King to Malcolm X to Stuart Hall, I just mentioned and others. Countless other people that are not recognized. Uh, Steve Biko, for example, one of the, the, the authors we always teach in my class uh, on race and racism. So um, it, 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 is, it is difficult to, uh, and I think we are at, at the crux now, at a crucial moment, when these questions are finally laid out on the table and people are, are finally interrogating um, and questioning things that uh, we, 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 we've been taking for granted for a very long time. And I think that's a good thing that we actually open, league, criticizing, challenging, questioning ourselves to start with. Like you said at the beginning of this conversation, ultimately, it is myself or it is I who I see in the mirror when I wake up in the morning. Um, and that's the question. That's the beginning of uh, critical thinking. Definitely. Uh, I'd like to remind our viewers that we are taking uh, questions and I will, by the, by the end of the, a conversation with uh, Professor Turda. I would, uh, I will, um, I will read some of the questions, and uh, with your permission, Professor, we will take some uh, questions from our uh, audience. We try to keep it uh, interactive. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to ask you, um, how do you see that? Uh, you know, a, a group of um, God-fearing, visionary. Uh, visionary politicians at the end of the 18th century uh, uh, with a clear uh, liberal uh, liberal mindset uh, in their majority and they created a, uh, a new a new republic uh, one that uh, hadn't been seen before still created a society that was uh, racist how was that possible uh, that's one of the most intriguing questions, of course, uh, of modern political history. Not that difficult to explain to scholars of race who, or um, historians of the Enlightenment uh, and so on and so forth, who practically uh, understood very well from which cultural tradition the founding fathers of America uh, extracted their ideas of liberty and freedom. Uh, so, but for the general population, this remains always a question. How can you create a country which professes to be uh, of free men at the time, as they call it, and women? Uh, however, this did not apply to um, black people. Um, they, kept, they kept slaves um, until very, until, uh, uh, you know, uh, until After the very... Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, um, and you have some of the, the major uh, um, uh, um, figures in this gallery of heroes, the pantheon of American nation, who actually had slaves themselves. Uh, so you have that question, which is really, a, 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 a really uh, centered on, on what is uh, America in many ways, and how was that possible? Um, now, in many ways, you realize at the time, and this will become a problem throughout uh, the history of America, some Americans are more Americans than others. So you have at the beginning, of course, uh, the whole Anglo-Saxon Protestant idea of who belonged to the political nation. The founding fathers mostly uh, used that kind of 
uh, understanding of political nations. They learn from the Enlightenment in Europe, particularly the Scottish Enlightenment, like Hume and Immanuel Kant and you know, philosophers. Uh, they used to, to formulate their own ideas of freedom and liberty that actually applied to people who possessed rationality and culture. And there was the big discussion was always whether the, the, the black people in America, uh, slaves at the time, majority of them slaves at the time, possess sufficient rationality to understand what liberty means. So the problem, the discussion they had, they did question themselves many times. And of course, they weren't, they were very intelligent people. The question they asked themselves, yes, okay, we freed the blacks, but what will they do? They don't know how to use, they are not evolved enough to actually know what to do with their, this is an argument, regrettably, that still functions quite well amongst big segments of American populations. You know, the blacks don't know what to do. You know, you need, they need to be governed because if you leave them alone, they don't know what to do. They resort to their animalistic nature. Uh, so philosophers of the alignment at the time, David Hume included, would assume that whilst um, the Europeans uh, and uh, so the white and the blacks is not really a differential category. It doesn't really matter the color of the skin. What really matter, and that's very complicated in a way, but even more profound in terms of its legacy, is the intellectual superiority of that particular group. So the white people actually had the capacity intellectually and culturally to create civilization to, uh, so this is how it happened. So in the country, God-fearing uh, and uh, loving of liberty uh, continued. Visionary, I mean, it was a fantastic cool. political project, right? It was the, the city on a yeah. hill. But it did continue way back. Um, um, so, I mean, if you think of uh, waves of immigrants coming into America in the 19th century, um, they continue to be looked at as, as inferior and not as equal. And it's very interesting that some of the, the people from Europe actually were considered to be inferior uh, and not actually white. I mean, we know this, it happened with the Irish, it happened with the Italians, it happened with the Greeks, it happened with the Hungarians. So the Italians and the Greeks, for example, until the Second World War, they didn't really mobilize culturally and politically um, as whites. They didn't, uh, they were always considered, particularly Italians from Southern Italy, uh, the, the Greeks, for example, were always considered to be Puerto Ricans or Mexicans because of the color of their skin. So you have a very late, so whiteness was not, was something acquired by certain people to others was a given. So it was given to them. It was a long process of, of transforming them into whites. Yeah, and this yeah. is just people who would normally in Europe would be considered, of course, European, white, superior. Mm -hmm. Whilst, of course, there was a completely different discussion. You, you know, when I when I listen when I listen to you, you know, I realize how um, how long this process was. But um, thankfully and um, and happily, it was a long process that has eliminated many of these uh, you know these attitudes based on pseudoscience, of course, and some. Uh, crass prejudices of the 18th century and 19th century. But it, it was the same process in Europe as well, because it wasn't, uh, the American case wasn't, of course, isolated. What happened in, for instance, Eastern Europe and in Romania during the 19th century and the 20th century, uh, where you had the, another uh, big group, uh, which was uh, the Roma population. Um. Yeah, that's, that's something that happens in the 20th century in particular. I mean, the Roma, of course, have been um, in a similar type of bondage uh, as the African-Americans, as the Black Americans for centuries in, in the Romanian um, provinces or the Romanian, the Romanian lands. So they, they were slaves for, um, for 500 years uh, almost, and they were emancipated or freed in the 19th century, when the, Roma when the Romanian lands become, a, a, in a way, a country and then a state. So part and parcel of the, you know, that transforming, transforming Romanians into a, a state, uh, uh, simultaneously it happens this proper process of social emancipation, economic progress. It happened uh, in the middle of 19th century, right? In the middle of the 19th century, so 1850s, for mm -hmm. example, Romani poor Romanians, 
ethnically called Romanians were in a very, uh, you know, precarious and pure, uh, sorry, poor, not pure. Well, some of them were pure as well. <laughs> very poor. Um, it is a uh, loaded it is, word. It's in poverty. <laughs> yeah, we may say that. Um, there wasn't really a big uh, difference between the Roma and the Romanians uh, in, in, in many parts uh, in terms of their living conditions or they were all illiterate and so on and so forth. But the Romanian state, of course, trying to create its own country for the Romanians, often use certain ways of um, discrimination and segregation and marginalization and st stigma towards um, its internal enemies, as it were, in, 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 towards groups such as the Roma, that they were perceived perpetually um, as asocials, um, as inferior, as they would say in the 20th century, this genic, or as, you know, as vectors of contamination and disease. Uh, and this is a language which emerges in the 20th century with eugenics and, and, and scientific racism, when the Roma are, uh, are demonstrably, um, with the use of science, are demonstrably uh, categorized as inferior and thus uh, not only uh, they don't belong to the, to, they don't belong in the Romanian nation, but actually they have to be eliminated. If they can't be pushed away or moved away, they have to be eliminated. As you would eliminate, to use a biomedical language, as you eliminate a disease. And you can see that happening, of course, uh, in the 1940s, uh, early 1940s, with their deportation to Transnistria. So you have that towards the Roma, but you also have it towards the Jews. So there's a very profound, uh, racial anti-Semitism in East Central Europe, uh, starting all, in Germany, all, all of course. The region, all the region, of course, and it, it, it reaches a quite pathological intensity in Romania as well, as we know, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, to culminate in the Holocaust. So you have uh, that, uh, that phenomenon of, of racism emerging quite, uh, quite clearly. Uh, in Romania as well, and is, uh, in other countries in East Central Europe in the 20th century, uh, in, con in connection, of course, with other forms uh, that we mentioned already at the beginning of this conversation, political ideologies such as, of course, uh, fascism or Nazism, nationalism, um, and so on and so forth. But, but, but you know, you know I'm, I'm, I've always been puzzled about how can one be still a racist or entertain a racist ideas or feelings after the horrors of the 20th century because we've learned a lot uh, where this attitude uh, can lead we've seen it with our own eyes so um, there are you know libraries uh, of uh, you know books and footage you know that that can show i mean we know and still we can you know and still racism is not eradicated how do you explain that it's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy to explain the legacy or the lingering effects of racism in contemporary uh, Eastern Europe uh, and particularly uh, in contemporary Romania. Um, one of the things that have to be highlighted is that uh, education actually was uh, quite, education with regarding racism and the Holocaust was rather lacking for many, many years, uh, many decades actually. It's only recently for the past maybe 15, 20 years that uh, Holocaust education is introduced in Romanian schools. People are finally learning about what happened during the Antonescu regime. Um, of course, you had the very glorified narrative about the Romanian past in which the Romanians are depicted as the best people, the very kind people, very good nurtured. And if something bad they can happen, <laughs> some of them are certainly, uh, we can't deny that if this, something bad did happen in the past, was basically at the hands of the foreign intervention. So whether it was the Russians or whether it was the Greeks in the 19th century, everything bad that happened in Wallachia or Moldova was because the Greeks did it. In the 20th century, of course, we had the Nazi um, or the Germany forcing um, Antonescu, of course, to, um, to, to, to deport the, the Roma and the Jews and, uh, and so on and so forth. So you have this, uh, discussion. You have it in Poland as well. You have it in, Rome in Hungary as well. How much actually it was a local contribution or mm -hmm. so, in Poland. other words, an indigenous way of thinking or it was external pressure. So because of that, 
it took some time until very recently the discussion about um, the Roma Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, about the deportation, uh, about racism, what happened into, into a period. I mean, we still don't know. I organized two exhibitions about eugenics and biopolitics yeah. and racial research in Romania uh, for the past two, two years. And, uh, and I traveled the country and I was utterly, utterly surprised at the level of um, interest. But at the same time, the young people did not know, did not know that in the interwar period, we had these pseudo ideas about, you know, people being superior and being inferior, measurements being carried out to, to, to catalog individuals, that the Roma and the Jews were considered to be, you know, a eugenic threat to the Romanian nation. Of course, they understand anti-Roma racism because this is it's very, very pronounced in Romania. But I mean, they're too young to remember anti-Semitism because there are basically virtually no Jews left in Romania. In current Romania, of course, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, one answer to your question is the lack of education. Mm -hmm. And I mean it very broadly. I don't mean to say there are no people who are not doing work. I'm not saying there, are, there aren't institutions, NGOs and activists uh, and young people who don't know. There are many people who know and they do a great deal of good work. But by and large, broadly speaking, if you cross Romania from east to west and from south to north, you would come across a very profound and you know, uh, disturbing form of um, uh, racial stereotyping, whether it's towards the Roma or whether it's towards the Hungarians or whether it's towards the Romanians. These are the main three categories that actually now function in a, in a triadic racial stereotyping that um, so it, it, is, it is a serious issue now emerging. And um, so the second issue is, of course, I suppose, um, the political um, will uh, to, to challenge uh, scholars, to provoke scholars to come forward and debate this publicly. So there's a very, it's very little serious conversation from major academic institutions in Romania. I'm talking about the universities, and I'm talking about the Romanian Academy. Uh, to tackle racism as a, as a, as a public issue, not as, a, not, not as an academic issue, but like you pointed out, as a public debate. These are the, the institutions that actually uh, are the, the, the towering uh, or the pillars of uh, respectability or of scientific respectability in any country, including Romania. And there's very little coming from them. So you have people who are not within the establishment trying to break out the stereotypes, the canonical reading of Romanianness that always describes the Roma as inferior, as a danger, or always describes the Hungarian as the hidden enemy waiting at the corner to take Transylvania away, and so on and so forth. So uh, we shouldn't blame the population, we shouldn't blame the public for knowing uh, less or for behaving in certain ways, as long as we're not willing at the same time to question the involvement of um, uh, political uh, elites and academic uh, people who actually know better and they should have tackled this early on since the 1990s. They had, um, they had time in, enough time to address this issue. So, so I, I would like to uh, try to take uh, some questions if with your, uh, with your permission. And I will start with our uh, friend, which is from Britain. And he's, um, of course, um, um, uh, Robert Para, uh, who is also one of the uh, the authors of uh, of one of the books that I have uh, mentioned at the beginning of our um, uh, of our conversation, and that is the identities in between in the East Central uh, and Central Europe. Um, and Robert uh, is um, asking uh, is asking us, uh, could you say a few? Is asking you, in fact, <laughs> could you say a few words? Could you say a few words about the tools intellectual can use empirically to debunk pseudoscientific discourse, especially on the internet? Uh, that's that's a very good question, and thank you, thank Robert. Robert. And uh, thank you, Rob, for, for thank you, and uh, thank you very much for tuning in to watch uh, this conversation. Uh, I, I I do appreciate it. Um, it is it is an issue uh, at the moment uh, across 
across the pond, I suppose, both in, in, in the US, but in Britain and Europe as well. Uh, how can we uh, understand the spread of racist uh, ideas and racism, pseudoscience and, and, and pseudo-nationalist ideas um, mm -hmm. over the internet? Internet is now, of course, the medium through which uh, pseudoscience um, is being uh, diffused, spread, and it inculcates the minds of people. Uh, it's not the books. No one goes to the British Library now to read a journal from the 1930s. You, you, if you're interested in a topic, say white supremacy, you Google it, and then of course you read allegedly scientific articles about why white people are superior. Um, and do we have an empirical tool to, um, to debunk that. We, well, of course, we do have an empirical tool. The question is, do we have access to the internet in the way other people have? Uh, and this is a big challenge for, for academics now to become more in internet savvy, to become more aware of how to, to disseminate uh, and pass on their message using the internet. We're very used to speaking in front of our students um, in the universities or maybe go to conferences or, or give very sort of, you know, scientific papers. Uh, but we need to learn how to, to translate that knowledge into a more uh, direct conversation over the internet. Empirically, there is need, of course, uh, to um, uh, those who are capable of doing that, of, re re you know, revising or um, controlling um, the information produced by certain sites and by certain publications online and by certain groups of people. And you could engage and uh, you know, decode, as it were, that racist message and debunk, as Rob put it there, debunk literally pseudoscience that is spread over the internet, particularly with respect to race and racism, particularly with respect to the inferiority of certain people uh, the, 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 and the superiority of others. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's a very interesting conversation. Another one to be had, I suppose. I, 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 I think I can jump in because we, I mean, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, program is um, approving itself. Um, uh, it's, of course, uh, broadcast live uh, on uh, Facebook. And when we, when we try to uh, publicize it, Facebook uh, <laughs> believed somehow that we were having a racist conversation until and, and blocked it. I mean, blocked the distribution of this um, of this information. And I think rightly so. If you know, if this had indeed been a, um, a conversation like that, but then we explained that no, this is a critical conversation with a very respected um uh, academic and it's uh, it's it's about uh, you know history and science of uh, racism and then they realize so they are uh, to to their credit they are trying to uh, to do something uh, something about it and uh, we have just seen the the proof and there is another interesting um, question about um fashion because in our while preparing this um uh, this conversation uh I pointed out to a, um, a, an article that says that uh, on the internet, the ideal, ideals of beauty that are widespread, dominant, uh, are in fact a racial combination. Um, uh, Caucasian noses, uh, darker skin, not white skin, darker skin, uh, African uh, lips, uh, uh, I don't know, or Middle Eastern eyes, uh, all these combinations uh, of, uh, of races. And, uh, and maybe it, it signals, especially in, the, in younger generations, it signals an end of all these horrible uh, prejudices. And this question is somehow uh, related, but to eugenics, uh, uh, Sonia uh, is asking you, how much do you believe that ideas like fashion and beauty can function as tools for enforcing eugenics? So, uh, a bit different, but also related to the mm -hmm. idea of fashion, because what, uh, what we have seen on the internet is the fact that in terms of the racial definitions, you know, of, it's, it's not superior to be white, you know, in terms of beauty. 
It's on the on contrary, it's superior beauty to be a combination of so many racial features. But how does it work in terms uh, in the relationship to eugenics? Mm. Well, firstly, I should like to say that the very terminology used is problematic for me. So, I mean, what does it mean African leaves? African is a construction as much as Caucasian knows. So Caucasian is a construction, uh, a scientific uh, term that actually is, is loaded with racism and negativity. So uh, uh, that's, that's exactly the point I was making earlier about well-intended people uh, in, uh, in the fashion industry uh, who are putting all this together, a form of polymorphism, uh, but actually resorting to, to labels and terminology that's very problematic to many people not mm -hmm. only color-wise, but also gender-wise, uh, and so but on. So people forth. wouldn't describe but, themselves. Yes, but you're absolutely right. I mean, in terms of, um, in terms of fashion and beauty, um, there, is a, a, there is an attempt, and I think in many ways, uh, that always existed uh, in human culture, but we didn't pay attention to it because we were too obsessed with monochro monochromatic definitions of identity. But you always had people who were beautiful, even if they were dark skin or, or black, represented in pottery in ancient Greece or in paintings in medieval times. Uh, and so on, Nefertiti, Nefert <laughs> Cleopatra, beauty, the women who are considered to be the most beautiful women of all times, were actually not very white. <laughs> we don't know, but you see what I mean? So of course there is an yeah. evolving concept of what, uh, and that's the tendency is, uh, to not stay within, uh, to, to, to transgress uh, what can be called racial boundaries. In America, this is very pronounced, and, and often you have, is the Times, Newsweek uh, magazine, they always run issues. The National Geographic did a special uh, issue recently about polymorphic identities that based on mixed, very mixed races, seven, eight, ten, or racial groups or ethnic groups, let's call it. What about this, uh, this uh, question about uh, whether um, beauty can and function I'm, as a tool for enforcing eugenics? And now I'm coming to beauty. It's interesting because, of course, in the history of eugenics, um, that kind of um, uh, a prototype, what is the, 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 the sublime form of human beauty, which, of course, race is used as well, following classical uh, types, uh, the beautiful woman, the beautiful man, the Aryan, uh, woman, the Aryan man, and so on and so forth. They served as a type to follow. So, of course, you had beauty pageants in America in the 1920s, where, of course, you had to be the classical racial and eugenic type to be um, elected as, um, as uh, the queen of the pageant, to, to be uh, elected as the most beautiful woman around. Ironically, it happened in countries like Romania and Hungary as well. In, in into Romania, we had eugenic contests <laughs> about beauty. So they were like patent contests, but actually it was all designed with a eugenic purpose in mind. So you have that. I think that's a very interesting question how beauty is formulated as a, as a ways to pass on eugenic messages. Who is the, the deserving one? Who is the undeserving one? Who is the superior? Who is the inferior? How you define it? So, in this particular relationship, eugenics and beauty, as much as eugenic and fashion, would serve to reiterate, re-attribute re, uh, certain eugenic qualities to people. Um, and now it's done very subtly, of course, in the interwar period, uh, both in America and in Romania was done very, was done very openly. Of course, um, you had committees selecting people based on eugenic criteria. And beauty was a eugenic trope in the big discussion about what is to be American. That continued well into the 1950s. So if you look at the prototypical American family in the 1950s, you know, the baby boomers, how are they looking? Yeah? They are sublimely white, well-dressed. It's a very clear Hollywood type of making of eugenic beauty of the American family. Uh, that American family, not the other American families, of course, which we know they didn't conform to the time. So, there is a very interesting um, um, research to be conducted in this field. Uh, and I hope Sonia will, will do some of that um, um, uh, if she's interested, as I suppose she is from her question, in the relation between fashion, beauty and eugenics. I, uh, I, you have already answered to some of the questions that I see here. And I, I think the, our viewers are uh, satisfied with the, the answer because uh, you, know, you, you have uh, 
you've answered. Uh, but we are now, I mean, it's, it's great that we are finishing on the beauty note, um, whatever we, de we defined it. Uh, you know, I, I feel the need to quote a famous writer that for, for sure beauty will save the world. Uh, but- uh, Well, we started know, with the beast. That, that is very diverse and, uh, you know, <laughs> very, very diverse. Um, uh, just to, to remind our viewers that our um, series of uh, online uh, exclusive original content um, uh, continue uh, throughout, the, throughout the week. Um, yes, it's the publicity moment. Uh, now, uh, uh, please join us in a uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful recital, a beautiful, beautiful musical gift offered by um, the great uh, mezzo-soprana Ruxandra Donose in our Enescu Suarez uh, online. And that is uh, tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow evening at, um, at seven o'clock. Uh, it's a, a series of uh, a cappella, uh, an a cappella recital, a series of, uh, of Romanian songs and defined as a gift to, uh, to all uh, Roxandra, Roxandra Donose's uh, fans in uh, North America. Uh, then uh, on, uh, on from Friday, uh, don't miss a new episode in our um, visual arts series, Art Fights uh, Corona, Artists Respond to the Pandemics. And we are, there is a, um, an excellent, very, very interesting, um, uh, film, um, short film made by uh, Megan Dominescu, one of the uh, the most uh, the most active members of the young generation of uh, uh, visual uh, visual artists. Don't miss the also the um, the the article, the Friday article on our uh, blog. It's about uh, Leon Ferraru, the the writer and academic uh, who. Um, gives uh, his name to our series of conversations, so to this, uh, this program, written by our longtime um, collaborator, Professor Mona Momescu of uh, Columbia uh, University. And next time at the Leon Ferraru conference series uh, online, we have the pleasure to uh, welcome uh, um, one of the, um, the most um, influential people in Romanian uh, cinema, um, the director, producer, um, cultural uh, entrepreneur, Tudor Giurgiu, mm -hmm. uh, with a conversation about Hollywood, American popular culture in Romania and living and growing up uh, with, uh, with Romanian um, with American popular culture, a conversation also about, um, about success, about making successful films and distributing them uh, throughout uh, the world. And of course, about subtle or less, more or less subtle influences between America and Romania when it comes to uh, cinema. Mm -hmm. But um, I... before we said goodbye, I want to thank once again, Professor, uh, Mario Sturda for this very, very interesting and difficult conversation. There are so many nuances that I know we haven't had the chance to, uh, uh, to, uh, to tackle. If you like to learn, uh, to learn more, go to the libraries and take uh, Professor Sturda's books. They are quite, quite uh, amazing and full of, uh, of uh, details and, uh, and uh, an analysis. Professor Sturda, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much indeed for your invitation. It's been a real pleasure.